Great. Well, welcome, everyone. You've made it to Thursday 515 at SoCap. You're welcome. <laughs> Good job. Uh, my name is Amy Hartzler. A lot of gratitude to be on the stage with these folks. Um, I will mention you might see five names up there and four bodies up here. We were supposed to have five and a half. Nikki Silvestri is very pregnant uh, and woke up this morning and could not breathe, so was not able to join us. Um, we are wishing her well, and we'll, uh, we'll share some of her insights today in her absence. Um, but yeah, we'll just take you, give you a quick spin of, of who we are on the stage, and we'll start with the next slide, Alpha. Oh, hi. hi. Hello, everyone. Do you want to... Do you want me to introduce myself? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just uh, wanted to add to Nikki's news that she can still breathe, but was having difficulty yeah. due to the air. It's minor correction, right? Thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Alpha Demalash. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Rising Tide Capital. We're a nonprofit organization that is headquartered in Jersey City, New Jersey. We've been around for about 14 years, and uh, we work with entrepreneurs in inner city communities to help them start and grow their own businesses. And we're in the process of expanding our work nationally with partners. So we're delighted to be here with you and uh, looking forward to communicating effectively. <laughs> uh, so good evening. My name is Rodney Foxworth. I'm here sort of in two capacities, I guess. Um, I am the incoming executive director of Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, and I'm also the uh, founder of an organization called Invested Impact. Um, and I'm actually realizing that, so Alpha's on my board, and she's also um, a fellow. Um, we have a local economy fellowship um, that focuses on individuals that are pioneering local economy solutions. Um, and I'm also realizing that um, we have a connection as well because of my work with the Calvert Foundation and the Hours to Own initiative uh, in Baltimore that we'll speak to a little bit about in a bit. Great. Mm -hmm. and well, hi, everyone. Um, oh. I'm actually going to, this is an alphabetical order, and we are not sitting in alpha order, so I apologize, but I oh. am Amy Hartzler, uh, just to keep you guys awake. Um, part of what we're going to share today are some insights that emerged in my work contributing a chapter to a book you might have heard about while you've been here this week uh, by Jed Emerson, The Impact Asset Handbook for Investors. Um, that was a, an early attempt to um, try to produce some best practices, share some, some messaging that we know works, um, some things to maybe avoid uh, in, in what is a really emergent industry. I mean, one thing that I would say on the communication side, if you're working in impact investing, um, if anyone tells you they're an expert in this, I would go in the other direction. Um, no one has it quite figured out, in part because it's an emergent space and in part because it's a really complex subject, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, to communicate about. So we'll share more about that today as well. Great. Well, hi, everyone. Andrew Perucci. Uh, I head up Calvert Foundation's marketing and user experience work. Um, a lot of that ends up being communicating to general audiences, so people who are not really steeped in impact investing in the way we are and don't speak the lingo and are just kind of getting their feet wet and trying to understand um, where they can engage. Uh, for folks who aren't familiar with Calvert Foundation, we are a nonprofit investment firm. Uh, we have a portfolio of mission-driven organizations, about 100 right now, um, it, both in the U.S. and 70 countries. Uh, the portfolio is around 350 million, and what makes Calvert Foundation a bit unique is that we work with both accredited uh, larger investors and also non-accredited investors. So we have a product called the Community Investment Note. It's very widely available, very accessible, um, and so part of our history and mission has always been about democratizing impact investing, so reaching those people who might not even consider themselves investors with this message that you can align your money, however small it might be, with the things that you care about. Um, so we, yeah, we have kind of the 80-20 effect where most of our capital actually comes from the larger uh, corporate investors or institutional investors, but most of the number of our investors are individuals. So uh, over our 20 plus year history, we've worked with uh, 
probably 18,000 individuals uh, to help them kind of align their money with their values. So looking forward to sharing some of our insights from, of the, uh, from some of the engagement campaigns that we've done. Thank you. And yeah, just to briefly add to Nikki, who is totally safe and breathing well <laughs> now, because she's home. Um, yeah, Nikki, uh, I'll share a few of the, uh, of the uh, contributions that Nikki has made to this field, but just wanted to kind of honor her, honor her work in this space and uh, certainly brilliant bright light in her right. And we'll go ahead and move on into communicating about impact. So we have uh, a very big topic to try to touch on, you know, touch on many specific aspects of today. Um, uh, one of the things that made me excited to pull together, you know, these folks to be in conversation with today is that, you know, we really do bring some experience uh, across a number of channels. We have folks who have been broadcast, podcasts, um, obviously print, um, as well as just thought leadership more generally. So we'll touch on a number of things, um, in part because Nikki is not able to join us in particular. We're going to leave some really uh, nice open time for Q&A, so please consider the questions, the burning questions you have about communications in this space, and we will try to take all of them um, as possible. Uh, next slide. Uh, wanted to start with a little bit of context, and we can go to the next slide again. Um, it's a noisy world, I'm sure you all know well. Uh, we've, we've really wired ourselves at this point as humans to ignore and delete as much as possible in this kind of broad scheme of what we see every day. Um, there's a study that was done, uh, fMRI brain scans, that show in particular that when we are exposed to messages about giving, our way, giving away money to do good, charitable giving, dopamine is released, all these happy parts of our brain lights up, um, when we're shown messages about uh, deferred returns or investing, all those happy parts of our brain shut down and our, the, literally the reptilian base of our brain is what's activated. So at this point, we've literally wired ourselves as audiences, as consumers of messages about money to not take in that information, to in fact actively ignore it while, while activating the, the parts of our brain that do not know how to make sense of this idea of doing good with investment capital. So I share that because if, if you're like me, you've struggled to find those messages that resonate with people and it's not just you. Um, it's that our, as audiences, as actual media consumers, we have trained ourselves to receive messages this way. So hard to make a connection, um, hard to then sustain a dialogue, not to, not to discourage you. We're also gonna share some things that work, but I just feel like it's important to obviously understand um, the science, the actual science of what we're, what we're dealing with. Um, next slide, yeah, ne and go ahead to the next one. Um, I think it's also really important from a context perspective to just have a sense of the, the ratio of what philanthropic dollars look like as compared to invested wealth. Um, and if we actually go to the next slide, we can see the uh, sources for that data. The yellow, it might be a little bit hard to read, um, but in 2014, as this is cited, 358 billion in charity, um, in 2015, we see that investable assets are at 33 trillion. So understanding the role and the relationship between philanthropic capital and invested capital, both in terms of how we receive content and communications, but also just in terms of the, the change that we're all trying to make in this world. Everyone's in this room because we believe that capital can actually create the world we want and, and just really recognizing the scale of how, um, in the scale and the role of philanthropic capital to kind of seed some ideas. Um, grow those ideas to the point where they're investable and then really do our best to constantly educate audiences so that they understand the, the volume of investable, investable capital that exists will allow us to begin that kind of hopefully increasingly uh, you know, quickening process of shifting capital out of destructive and extractive practices and into ones that actually create the world we want. Um, but again, just understanding this ratio, especially in, is our role in, in trying to communicate about invested wealth and creating trust with audiences by educating them in the context and understanding their role and creating pressure on the people who are supporting, in some cases, the direction of, of invested wealth is, is also important in the work we do. Um, so I just wanted to offer some guiding reflections and, and these are you know, kind of in the book as well. Um, 
you know, communications, at least, again, in my experience, um, I don't know if Andrew shared that too, and especially in your role, but oftentimes communications is, is kind of the last thing people think about. People are like, oh, we've designed this perfect thing, and here's the strategy, and now go tell amazing stories about it. Um, and as a communicator, it's really important, especially around money, for the reasons I've mentioned, that we have really good answers for these very predictable questions that come up. Why is the money going there? Who's deciding? Why, why, you know, what's gonna happen with my money when it goes there? Um, all of those questions have to have satisfying answers for people to actually make it, then go through the often also, also difficult steps of moving their money into good things. Um, so just understanding that communications really needs to be considered at the same time that you're thinking about the change you seek in your goals uh, is really important. Um, also, impact investing as a term, as much as I use it, and I suspect a lot of people do in this room, um, what I find, again, is that investors are just increasingly critical. They're like, well, what kind of impact does that, does that create? Is that the impact I want? Which may not be the impact you want. Um, this lack of standardization, the fact that we're all kind of operating from different sets of metrics, uh, and not using the same language to even talk about those things either, uh, again, makes it just very difficult to, to make a connection in, in a way that is satisfying and, and persuasive uh, in getting people to move their money from here to there. Um, so just offer those uh, as, as reflections in addition to just noting, you know, in particular as, as um, you know, I've, I don't know about other folks, but the last couple of days I've kind of had this headache and the smoke, you know, affects me and just these problems in our world are urgent and very tangible right now. Um, and nearby, and so I personally feel, you know, a great deal of, of urgency to, uh, to activate what I've learned and, and also share it if I can, um, along with the brilliance of these folks to help support our shared goal of moving money in a better direction. Um, a few questions that I think are helpful to keep in mind. Uh, some folks in this room are, are marketing a very specific product that produces a certain set of questions and needs. Um, I hear a lot of folks have come to me and they're like, we want to lead a movement. We want, you know, to get all the people investing all the money and all the good things. Um, those two things are different. They require different resourcing um, to some extent. They require a different commitment to long-term conversations with folks uh, and certainly different um, resources in some cases. Um, really understanding kind of in particular around impact and the positive impact you seek. What is that theory of change that's going to accomplish your goal is really key. In addition to, of course, understanding who that audience is that's most important to move. Um, again, a number of folks will come up and they'll say, oh, I need a viral video. And I'm like, do you? I don't know. Do you need to reach 10 million people or do you need to reach 300 of the right people? Those are key questions as a communicator that we need to have good answers to as well. Um, so next slide. Um, Want to introduce a slightly different way then of thinking about those audiences we're trying to activate. And then we're gonna hear about some examples of some of these folks. but. One of the things that I found really interesting, and again, the book chapter goes into much gr uh, deeper detail around each of these, what I call psychographics, big marketing term, which is really just meant to say, what are some of the themes that unite across your audiences in terms of their roles? So uh, I think you know, it's very common for people to say, well, I need my, audi my messaging matrix that says, talk to financial advisors this way, and I need to talk to my retail investors th this way, and my anchor institutions this way, and sometimes that's, that's true. And I think it's also helpful to really look at well, what's un what unites these folks across their different roles. Um, so I offer uh, what I, again what I call these psychographics. Um, one being the pragmatic altruist. I suspect a number of us in this room are are, are the pragmatic altruist, um, which is you know generally that kind of individual who just wants to do well and do good. They um, often come into impact investing through philanthropy. Um, may or may not want to be super involved in in the actual kind of weeds of their investments. Uh, but they're, they're really just trying to um, mitigate the harm that their capital can, can, um, can do. And then moving into, uh, I think, a, you know, an interesting, again, we'll hear some examples, systems weavers, people who look at collective assets in different places and think about how do we, how do we weave these together to have greater collective impacts than we could ever have as any one entity or any one institution. Um, and then there's that, you know, this radical seeker, um, you know, again, there's lots of, lots of them here. It's, it's wonderful to be in that company as well. These people who are pretty advanced financial activists, so pretty fluent in finance for the most part. Um, they're really looking for how do I activate every single dollar uh, in service of the world I'm trying to create. Um, we're hoping to create more of those all the time. And then there's the majority, I would argue, of people who are just indifferent. They may or may not have wealth. They, they may or may not have a lot of time, but they generally don't have a lot of interest. Uh, in thinking about their investments. So if we go to the next slide, we'll just 
kind of hold these ideas in our head and maybe some guiding questions and I'll just kind of offer it to Andrew to uh, share some examples of, of what, what we mean by the pragmatic altruist. Sure. Um, so from time to time I try to pick up the phone and call some of our investors um, and just sort of talk through what are your motivations for investing $50 on our own platform. Uh, what, how did you find out about us? What attracted you to us? You know, what caused you to kind of go through the process of putting in your bank account information and going through all these steps? Um, because it, it does get to, you know, some of those uh, emotional and, and functional needs that people have that go beyond sort of the persona level or the demographic level. So that's what we, we try to understand. Um, so one of the people that I talked with recently is a 26-year-old woman uh, from Illinois who over the past, I'd say, three years has built up a balance of about $300 with us in increments uh, between $20 and, and $50. So she'll buy a note for $20 and then a $50 note and, and so on. Um, and so I, in talking through that with her, you know, she, she has both kind of the, the practical needs and, and also I would describe it as more kind of the emotional needs that our product uh, kind of fulfills for her. So, you know, she's very organized and methodical in how she manages her finances and her investments on a monthly basis. She logs into all of her bank accounts, all of her investment accounts, grabs her balances, put the, puts them into a Google spreadsheet. And so I thought that was really interesting because even though she only has about $300 with us, she really wants to know exactly um, kind of how much interest has accrued on her investments and and so on. But at the same time, we were talking through more of her, well, why did you invest motivations? And she was telling me about how her family perceives kind of her charitable giving and her, uh, her investing, and they don't necessarily agree with the fact that she's doing impact investments or investments that have this explicit uh, social outcome. And so she sort of sees investing with us as making a statement to her family that look, I can earn returns, and this is a viable, legit investment product, but at the same time, it supports a number of the issues that I care about. So it's empowering women, it's getting finance to, uh, you know, small entrepreneurs that need, uh, that need loans and things like that. So I think for her, it's, it's kind of balancing those two modes of engagement as she works with us. Um, and then the other example is a really interesting guy who lives in Texas, He's about 60, and I, I would describe him as libertarian. I don't know if, in fact, he is a libertarian, but uh, just some of the ways that he was describing his investment methodology kind of caused me to think that, okay, you know, this guy holds those views. So his thing was that he had done pretty well for himself in the business world and his in own investments, and now felt more of a need to give back, but to do so in a way that wasn't just giving away all of his money, you know, he really wanted to see uh, his investments as empowering people, helping people um, help themselves become more self-sufficient. Uh, so for him, it really wasn't, oh, I see needy people and I want to support them with an investment. It's, okay, I'm investing in you and you have to make yourself better. So those are just two examples of, mm -hmm. of how people kind of approach our product and, and think about our product. <laughs> And then we have some systems weavers, which I think Rami may be offering up some examples of. Yeah, so <clears throat> I should say before I get into the systems weaver sort of uh, examples that I have, um, just thinking about the importance of communication at every step of the way in the work that I've done in the social sector, particularly. And to Amy's point, oftentimes we just really think about communications as like the very last thing and don't put enough investment into it. And to really think about many of the things that I know many of us, certainly on stage, but I know many of you in the audience, we're really grappling with really large challenges and opportunities, right? And so even thinking about the communication strategies that we've employed through a variety of different things that I've done in my career, whether it was with Be Me, where we're really trying to create a much more holistic picture of African-American men in the communities where like Detroit, Baltimore, Philadelphia, where quite frankly, um, African-American men are seen as uh, not as assets, but as challenges that need to be solved, right? That's a big challenge across the country. Um, thinking about the question in Baltimore when we founded the Impact Hub, 
are we really looking at social entrepreneurship as a real viable opportunity for challenging some of the uh, systemic issues that exist in the city? And then thinking about now my role at Bali to consider how do we get people to really think about local solutions, local economic solutions, and reimagining what the economy can look like, right? These are all really massive opportunities and challenges. And quite frankly, communication has to be centered. We have to think about storytelling. We also have to be really sophisticated about how we take that approach. Um, and I really have always thought about how much change can happen if we really center communication, being really strategic, and really being um, sophisticated in our approach. Um, so that said, much of my work has really been around ecosystems, right? And so when I think about systems weaver, I myself am one, but I'm gonna speak a little bit about some of my colleagues and partners that I've been able to work with, um, particularly in my work in Baltimore City. But I think of, for example, a, a colleague of mine who is the chief business officer for a large nonprofit organization that actually creates their own social enterprises. And the organization has really been grounded in human services and workforce development for many years. And over the last 10 years, have really made the connection between entrepreneurship and investment and in advancing the, the opportunities for low income, uh, low wealth individuals, and particularly in East Baltimore, um, which is um, a very historically disinvested community, um, one of the more heavy hit uh, places in Baltimore City. And so this individual has come into it from her approach of how do we actually communicate and think about the ways that workforce development, human services, investing, and philanthropy can actually come together to advance the interests of particularly African Americans in East Baltimore. Um, and looking at it from her approach of, I care about the individuals in this, in this geography, but at the same time, how do I communicate to multiple audiences um, to make sure that we're advancing the interests of these folks. And, and so really having a, uh, an approach that is about weaving in many different stakeholders so that you're not really focused on just one stakeholder, but you're looking at it as a fabric that you need to weave together to have a, a, a coherent strategy, right? And so that's something that I think many of us are constantly uh, evolving toward. Um, we can't just look at it as we're solving uh, a situation of uh, poverty alleviation, or we're creating jobs, uh, we're doing tra uh, job training, but we also have to think about the investment capital that is needed, and how do we communicate to people um, that haven't necessarily looked at the fullness of, of you know, the breadth of the opportunities there to, to think more strategically and collaboratively. Um, and so that's one example, and I think about the work of Impact Hub, when we were founding that as well, we're really trying to make the case that an uh, impact hub in these, this community of social entrepreneurs was an opportunity for individuals across the city to have access to a platform for creating change in the city, right? And so many of our initial stakeholders were philanthropy, um, entrepreneurs themselves, and also traditional sort of, or more traditional uh, debt providers. And so they all shared this vision of what an impact hub could look like. But we also had to communicate in ways that were drastically different. Um, these were people that were in, uh, represented. We had investment from an anchor institution, a large university in the city, and their interests were really about how do we have an active space along this particular corridor in Baltimore City that our students would be interested in having access to. So that was one thing. Our philanthropic partners were really interested in creating entrepreneurial opportunities, uh, particularly for millennial entrepreneurs, but not exclusively. Um, and then many of them also were interested in the opportunities that could be afforded for job creation um, from the Impact Hub. And then we also had this really large community of entrepreneurs, particularly entrepreneurs that did not have access to a lot of the incubation spaces and co-working spaces in the city, and really were looking at a community-grounded solution. And so we had this multi-tiered approach in terms of engaging with multiple stakeholders. Great, yeah. Um, so working where I do, and also an urban environment, uh, very much similar to uh, the mix of audiences that uh, you have to cater to when you're a nonprofit. Uh, one thing that I will say that we did very early on at Rising Tide Capital when we decided, even just 
and naming the organization, there was a lot of uh, agonizing around how it is that we can ensure that brand could uh, communicate to the multitude of stakeholders that we were trying to bring to the table. Um, and so, you know, there is the saying, a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, that comes from a certain, uh, you know, uh, side of the political arena, perhaps. Uh, but we kind of uh, use that uh, to pull people in to have a conversation and to really be a storytelling organization right from the get-go to say, sure, logically, a rising tide can lift all boats. Uh, the question is, do we have boats? Uh, and so where we were located, we didn't have too many boats, uh, or at least uh, we had a lot of people who were trying to build boats, but they were wearing, uh, you know, life uh, jackets and uh, swimming against the tide. And so we're like, what would it look like for us to actually come together to build uh, boats? So that was uh, kind of a core decision around how uh, a branding decision could uh, enable you to tell really you know, powerful stories that people don't forget and that could help bridge divides across a multitude of different audiences. Uh, then when we uh, looked at the work of building entrepreneurs in the communities where we were working to, uh, uh, to do this work, uh, we realized that um, the storytelling about the work itself and about the people and the entrepreneurs was just as important as actually resourcing them with the business management education, the coaching services, and the long-term interventions that we'd envisioned, and that we would need to tell these stories over the long term and in a sustained way. Uh, that meant it most definitely made sense for us to be a nonprofit. Uh, secondarily, we uh, opted, even before we built out a fundraising and development team, uh, which is core to the nonprofit survival, we actually built out a communications team. And so to this day, the communications team at Rising Tide is stronger than all the other teams, and it acts as a hub for a variety of different communication needs. So, um, you know, out of a team of 30 that are focused on mostly on the program side, you have four people whose everyday jobs full-time is dedicated to manning the variety of different audiences and platforms that need to be communicated through. Uh, the beauty of doing that has been uh, multifold. Uh, it enabled us to tell really uh, compelling stories about our entrepreneurs, uh, not just to other external audiences, but really to our entrepreneur community uh, and to the places where they live and they work. Uh, it enabled us to shift uh, how the communities where we work are actually perceived, as opposed to being places where there is uh, disinvestment and drugs and violence. It became a place where people are starting all kinds of things. Uh, so people would say, I don't know what's going on with that neighborhood, but I'm seeing these people are starting all kinds of things. So we would play stories about our entrepreneurs in their local papers. Uh, we even, uh, one uh, wonderful example is uh, uh, we were very successful with one of our entrepreneurs to such a point that people thought that she was running for office or people in the community thought she was preparing to run for office. She'd never considered running for office before. Uh, her business also involved working with elder care services. And so they were, uh, most people were absolutely convinced that uh, she was going after the elder vote because that's who votes in our communities. Uh, and lo and behold, now she's a, a state assemblywoman in New Jersey um, because she decided to run for office once she'd built up a, a great following. Uh, and she's a wonderful and hyper communicator because we also instill that in our entrepreneurs, how to communicate as they're building their uh, companies. Uh, but, you know, we are funded by a variety of different kinds of funders. I mean, if you looked at the um, mix of audiences just in our funder pool, there is tremendous diversity for the reasons why they invest in our mission. And so communicating to them is not a one-size-fits-all exercise by any measure. So I think one of the things that has been really helpful when you're looking at this impact space where you have such a diversity of reasons for why people show up, being able to try and thread across what the values are that move them to come there and then have like phenomenal you know, communications experts say, hey, that is a radical seeker. And you're like, great, I would never have called it a radical seeker, but yes. 
and we have radical seekers who are on um, you know, one extreme of the political spectrum uh, to another. And they never, like they, they don't necessarily you know, hang out with each other. Someday we hope they will uh, get to hang out with each other in really deep and meaningful ways. But they're mutually investing in a mission space because they care about this mission for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and they're trying to reimagine how they could use their, use their capital to actually have uh, the same impact because everybody agrees that people should build boats as fast as possible and we should put people in them so we could all rise together. Uh, so there is uh, a tremendous power in having and resourcing a communications uh, infrastructure and maybe that is the kind of thing where when you look at it from a business model perspective, you say, oh, this is so expensive, uh, it's, it's too much, we can't carry it, but it's really, it's not, um, I think the benefit that I've found in building out a comms infrastructure is that you can uh, pivot as quickly as the times are shifting all around you. And so, it, you know, when you're often engaging with just outside consultants or around a very specific and narrow topic, by the time that piece comes back to you, the world has already changed. Uh, and it's kind of frustrating and you've already, and then you're like going through changes and you pay for all of the changes along the way and in the end you just like, oh, you know, give up. But uh, when you have an in-house team, you could, and you would still need to resource them because there is like a tremendous hunger for like immense 24 seven communications. Uh, but you can be really nuanced in the ways in which you can use social media. You can uh, be thoughtful and create thought leadership pieces. Uh, but all of that takes a lot of like massaging and uh, culling different kinds of knowledge from different parts of your uh, universe uh, that it, it is very helpful to have that kind of backbone infrastructure in your entities uh, to, to try and, and push uh, your communication strategies. And uh, you know, greater visibility means greater credibility, means greater fundability, hopefully, for all of our work. Including funders like Peter. Including funders like Peter. Peter Buffett and Jennifer Buffett are part of uh, like an example of uh, radical seekers uh, where uh, certainly I, I could say that their investment in our mission has been incredibly holistic and you know something that they've partnered with us on is not only resourcing the work but being able to have conversations about the work and their why and being willing to really engage in a way where you know uh, we've had podcasts where we talk about why this work is really important along with Peter. Uh, and Peter uh, is coming to an event actually on November 2nd in New Jersey. If you're around, you're more than welcome to come join us uh, where he's gonna tell his story of his relationship with money uh, with piano and cello accompaniment uh, because this is how creative you have to get when it comes to having conversations about money and making sure everybody's wired and awake and uh, trying to reach people in different ways. Um, yeah. Thank you so long. So we, I think we're going to move along to some, just some tactical recommendations and kind of holding some of these different audience types in mind um, as well as, as some just what, I, what I'm calling easy easy-ish wins at least, and then we'll leave time for Q&A. So the next slide we'll see is a, a chart um, which goes into much more detail in the, in the book chapter and the impact assets handbook for investors. But just it gives you a sense, as, as Alpha was saying, you know, I think what I've seen over and over again is the most successful communications are ones that are grounded in shared values. They're not necessarily ones, you know, that talk about these are the best, you know, product features, you know, this is how great, you know, our financial structure is. There are things that call in our desire for courage or imagination or agency. Um, and so this is not prescriptive. This is not, you know, uh, cover every single beautiful flavor of humanity. Um, but just to give you a sense of, of, of how there are key themes and values um, that have been tested to be resonant with these different types of audiences. Um, one thing you'll probably see is that radical seekers, no surprise, tend to want all of it. I want equity, I want vision, I want you know, self-sufficiency, and that's what they don't settle for much less, um, which is what makes them radical. Um, but we'll move on to the next slide and yeah, share an infographic. Yeah, um, so this is an example of a 
a win that we've had at Calvert Foundation in communicating very succinctly and, and uh, clearly, hopefully, um, about how the investment product works from the perspective of an individual. So what we're really trying to communicate here are three concepts. The first one is that it is a pooled fund. Um, so you're putting your money in with thousands of other investors. The second concept is that it's supporting a diversity of different types of organizations and projects from agriculture to housing to education to small business lending and so on. And the third one is that you get your money back. So it's not that you make a donation one time and you walk away from it. It is this ongoing relationship that you have where you stay tethered to the returns that are being generated by these organizations. Um, so we've gotten a lot of use out of this and it's something that we've put together in probably an hour and have used in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that's important just to underscore there is just people obviously learn in different ways. So clearly having visual content to support the many, many words that a lot of us love uh, is just really important. So uh, next slide. Um, let's just go ahead and do the next slide, actually. Um, one experiment that we did that was really interesting, this is for the Hours to Own campaign. It's a place-based impact investing campaign with Calvert. Um, which is a campaign that I helped name and brand and launch. Um, we wanted to do a very specific target uh, to millennials. And so there's a lot that we know about millennials. I'm sure you guys probably know this stuff too. Um, but one of the things that we found through extensive testing with Upworthy, now this was a couple of years ago, uh, they were hitting about 800,000 unique folks a month. Um, lots of email subjects, lots of landing pages with like new economy, you know, uh, Wall Street to Main Street, you know, all, all these different terms around, you know, investing, crickets, no clicks. Um, Upworthy said, you know, leverage what we call the curiosity gap, which is one of the ways that they get people to engage with content. Um, this is, this can be a little bit tricky. I think the important thing to, um, and it's kind of counter to a lot of advice that I even give, which is be really straightforward and be really clear. You know, this, this tactic, the goal was to um, just get li email, emails for our list. We wanted to be able to kind of top of the funnel, engage people who would not normally engage with us uh, so that we could begin a long-term conversation where we were kind of going back and forth between what I call head and heart-based content. So it's a long, you know, ongoing dialogue, you know, providing people with that kind of rational case for investing along with the heart-based storytelling. But this is just how do we get them in the door, right? Like we know that they don't want to think about this stuff, um, so how do we just start the conversation? So we ended up with this literally like a nonsense title. It's, it's in the, the video that we did, it was a 90 second piece. We, hired, we um, cast two comedians and scripted this 90 minute piece that basically you know, suggests like why, why can't we expect investing to create real value that I can see and also create real financial returns that I can benefit from. Um, so the, the subject headline that tested, out tested everything else was two guys, uh, I, can't, I, mean, I can't even read this exactly, two guys in a room start arguing uh, it lasts for 90 seconds, it's passive aggressive and funny, theme, that was it. It's like, not, I mean, this is literally, this is nothing. But what was so fascinating <laughs> was that after people clicked through to that, it outperformed every other comparable. And so it shows you that people, even if they're not interested, if you tell them this is what it's about, they're not interested, but once they get in it, higher shares, higher signups than any other relevant promotional content. So for this campaign, I think it's a valid question, what does success look like? Is 5,000 names on a list or 2,500 names in a week, is that success? All I can tell you is those are 2,500 names we didn't have before we ran this campaign. That's 2,500 conversations you can start you know, in a week. Um, and that was important for, for us to continue to, get, to gather more data to understand how do we have a satisfying relationship with people and answer the questions that come up for them. Um, so next slide. I'll, Offer this up in, in Nikki's absence. Nikki Silvestri helped manage and brand this campaign on behalf of another radical seeker, Sally Calhoun, who's also part of the um, Bali community and the in local economy investor circle, uh, the No Regrets Initiative. So this is one of those beautiful cases where you get two words that say a whole lot, no regrets. Uh, Sally has a, a fully integrated regenerative asset strategy that is deployed across a charitable foundation, the Globetrotter Foundation. Um, an investment um, vertical, Cienega Capital, and uh, also she's a, she's a rancher. She has a 7,600 ran uh, acre ranch where she actually practices holistic land management and pilots a lot of things that she ultimately invests in and, and, and grants to, uh, specifically around soil health. That's um, Sally's primary focus is soil health and regenerative agriculture. 
Uh, so the website kind of leads three so people through a series of questions. That's one thing I would offer as a tactic. It's inquiry-based messaging in this field in particular is very successful. What do I do now? How do, you know, what does this mean? Just asking questions that allow the, the, the audiences to start answering those questions and engaging with your content, very successful. In this case, you know, what I would consider the easy win um, is giving them just a clear call to action. What do I do now? Commit to having no regrets. What does no regrets mean to you? It might be different than what it means to me, but be in that inquiry about defining what it means at the end of your life to say, I am really proud of what every dollar that I contributed to this economy did in my life. So not an easy win, exactly. It's, 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 it's a tall task, but um, really compelling, compelling framing and messaging. Next slide. The easy win, just to be bold and clear, just. <laughs> Yeah, so um, this is really interesting. Uh, I wanted to first say, again, to reemphasize everything that's been said, but you know, communication really is, or can be and should be a, a doorway to opportunity. And one of the things that Alpha pointed out was thinking about the context and the, place that she, the places that uh, Rising Tide works in. And I think, I'm thinking about this conversation that was in the other day where you know, someone said, you can't, uh, describe a place as, you know, full of poverty, uh, there's not opportunity and addiction, all these sort of things, because if you want me to invest in that place, I want to see opportunity. <laughs> um, and I think it's, it's really important to think about that in the context of the work that we all do and what you're working on. Um, I'll give you an example just really quickly to think about, for example, in the city of Detroit, which is 83% African American, when I was with the Knight Foundation and BME, which at the time stood for black male engagement, uh, we did a media audit of um, media coming out of the city around innovators and entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. And when you did that media audit, it was almost exclusively young white individuals. Um, and so what kind of context does that provide when you're thinking, you're trying to make the case that we need to invest in African American and other minority entrepreneurs, when from a communication standpoint, by and large, we're actually not framing the fact that African American women are actually the the largest uh, or the fastest growing entrepreneur population in the country. Uh, we use language like non-traditional entrepreneurs when we refer to women and minorities. And in fact, women and uh, minority entrepreneurs are the fastest growing and have consistently been, uh, been entre entrepreneurial. So just the framing of how we actually communicate what opportunities are for investment. And I also do this myself in terms of trying to set the problem statement, but also turning that on its head and inviting people in to invest as well. Um, so as a segue, um, uh, what Amy's referring to, the need for black rage and philanthropy was a piece that I wrote last year and actually became quite uh, viral. And it goes to what Amy's converse, uh, point was earlier. This is a very specific topic. Uh, philanthropy, not everyone is in, and it was particularly, it was a piece about uh, institutional philanthropy and the lack of investment being made into um, communities and uh, nonprofit institutions, enterprises that were founded and led by people of color, individuals that were disproportionately impacted by social injustices. Um, and so I wrote this piece really to a specific audience. Um, it wasn't for main, like the entirety of America, it was for individuals that are engaged in the day-to-day -day, uh, in philanthropy. And so while I had, you know, I wrote a piece that um, had a bold and clear uh, title, it was also directed to specific audiences and constituencies. Um, and so what we were able to do is we segmented out our communications channel once I wrote the piece to make sure we were getting into the right hands. And at that point, it became surprisingly viral. I think we, we, it cleared over 10,000 individuals. It was placed in media um, that was very specific to philanthropic and impact investment publications. But because our strategy was always about reaching those core audiences, we weren't looking to get this into the hands of uh, all Americans, or even everyone who's working in the social impact space. We're actually being very clear that we wanted this to be a piece that would get in the hands of and influence and spark conversation uh, from individuals and institutions that we were particularly trying to address. Um, and so it was, it went, uh, it was successful beyond our imagination. 
uh, we were able to really have, it uses opportunities to spark dialogue in Baltimore City with the local philanthropic and impact investment community about what it would look like to actually get much more investment into uh, organizations that were founded by people of color in the city. And we were able to do a follow-up campaign in person to do a lot of work with the individuals that, um, that we're targeting. And so we had a lot of dialogue. We were able to then support and figure out a way to shape some of the philanthropic practices that institutions were working with. And also outside of the city, we were able to become, uh, to begin influencing and, uh, and having dialogue with philanthropic communities that were really wrestling with challenges of how they are, in, or how are they are not investing um, in communities of color. Uh, they have tremendous leadership. And just to go back to my earlier point, one of the first questions that came from um, a lot of my colleagues um, after this piece came out was, Rodney, are there enough African-American and um, entre social entrepreneurs of color in places like Baltimore City? Again, going back to say, when we make the argument when we started with BME that we had hundreds upon hundreds of African-American men that were doing work in places like Baltimore City uh, and it was a disservice because we had created this framework that African-American men and social entrepreneur and people of color could not be social entrepreneurs, right? Were in fact problems that needed to be solved. And it was really interesting to see how this piece, the first reaction from many folks was, are you sure that there are enough uh, individuals in these communities uh, that are, have taken on leadership? And so it opened up the door for a conversation that we really wanted to have uh, with philanthropists and institutional investors. And I would, I guess, add to that, just based even on the comments in this article, I, and I think one of the reasons why it also caught hold, not, I mean, in addition to this a brilliant strategy, that was executed really well, people wanted to have this conversation. People were, people, it gave people the opportunity to say, like I know one of the comments was, this, this has dominated my organization today. And, and, I, and I think it just speaks to that idea of relevance. People are, want to have the conversation. If you're able to produce the content that allows them to have it, you can accelerate. Um, the next slide, please, is rising tide. Yeah, so aspirational imagination. Imagination, warm, not so much uh, heavy duty, uh, you know, activating head, uh, but also playing to uh, Rodney's point about, uh, you know, how we brand this mission space and how we talk about the work uh, and how we need to kind of appropriate terms that have been modified, like entrepreneurship and like black entrepreneurship or uh, low income entrepreneurship. It's like, well, it's, it's entrepreneurship. And so um, it's just, you know, who does it and from where do they come? In this case, it's actually interesting because this speaks to the indifferent. This is our, um, uh, we we're hosting an event, the, the one that I just mentioned, and we're having it on the waterfront of Jersey City, which is a highly developed area where uh, the, literally the rising tide you could see. There's been a huge um, you know, boom in uh, development. And so, and as a result, a lot of the people who uh, work there, they're some of the most educated uh, workforce uh, on the glo in the globe, essentially. Like, I think we have like a 30% uh, post-secondary education uh, rate there. There is, it's huge. Uh, but most of those people certainly shuttle right back out to uh, Manhattan once they're done with work, uh, or if they're living there in those residential units, like they don't come out. One of our entrepreneurs created this phenomenal marketplace, um, literally proving a point to one of the developers, actually, uh, that y you, know, you could have, she called it a midnight market, and about 2,500 to 3,000 people started showing up to this area that is usually just abundant office spaces in the middle of the, the night. Uh, so we're partnering with her to host this event uh, in the hopes of being able to tap on the shoulders of the indifferent who would certainly not come out if we told them, hey, you know, we're hosting this uh, event for this particular purpose. It's like, no, opportunity is universal. You get to come and have a warm, fuzzy time. It's going to feel like midnight market in Marrakesh without you needing to buy your ticket to Morocco. Great food curated, great music by a known, you know, philanthropist. Come on now. So we're using every trick in the game to get the indifferent to begin to engage because they're the ones that have the resources and the options to be able to make decisions about how they might want to invest in their local entrepreneurs. And I know we talk a lot 
lot in the impact space uh, around proximity, that we need proximity. I know in the social space we talk about it with Brian Stevenson, who champions this, that like, if you're not near, if you don't know, if you don't rub shoulders with the people that are running the companies or entities that you might want to invest in, that it becomes a really hard barrier to overcome. Uh, so being given opportunities where you can actually hang out and be human and you know celebrate and eat good food and get to know people in a different platform uh, is part of what this is about and you know bridging divides uh, once again Beautiful. while having fun. Term so important. Um, so the next slide is just a placeholder to turn it over to you guys and we will do our best to offer some thoughts people have questions. Any, any questions if folks are still awake? <laughs> sure. Where does the impact measurement come in? Do you want to repeat it? Yeah. Where does the impact measurement piece come in and communicating the qualitative and the quantitative side by side or what's the best way to do that and the role of, I guess, annual reports and impact reports and if they're still useful? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy yeah. to speak to that. Um, so in a couple of weeks, we'll be publishing our annual impact report, uh, which is a really critical piece for us to communicate with our investors. Um, it's something they look for every year. It's something they ask us about. And it's something that some of them really want to dig into. So they want to understand the methodology behind, well, how do you arrive at 10,000 housing units? Like, walk me through how you got that. Um, you know, walk me through um, sort of how my investment is connected to these big kind of obtuse numbers. Um, and so we try to do a, a clear job of explaining our methodology for collecting all the uh, impact outcomes from all of our borrowers and how we uh, blend all those outcomes together, how we kind of synthesize it and make sense of the data. Um, but to, to answer your question, our investors really look for both. So they want to see that there is that methodology behind how we measure impact and they want to understand that it is a really rigorous process. But at the same time, they just expect to see a nice human interest story of an entrepreneur in Kenya who got a $100 microloan and is benefiting from that microloan. So it's, it's really kind of including both of those things because um, our investors are so diverse and kind of where they're coming from and you know what uh, interest they have and kind of uh, their understanding of impact measurement and things like that, that we give, it, uh, give them both of those things. I, I would add, uh, and it's uh, definitely critical to mix both the stories and uh, the impact side. For us, um, you can check on risingtidecapital.org to see our annual reports. We get a lot of compliments on them. We include our dashboard, uh, which lets you know like activities that happen as well as you know the actual outcomes. Uh, and just like repeating uh, at different places, certain things that need to be highlighted, but also having kind of the fuller picture of how you measure uh, and why, uh, like your theory of change, incorporating uh, then like the stories are really critical. We found like, you know, even like not necessarily going, we used to do like fuller profiles of entrepreneurs and we decided that actually what people need is like a great picture and a couple of snippets about that, but like repeat them so they get a sense of an entrepreneur that they can relate to. Maybe like that guy who's working on, you know, the roof is their guy and that's the reason that they're gonna come and invest and connect versus, you know, a woman in a bakery or the guy with the Google glasses doing X, Y, Z. So it's having a mix of faces, a mix of businesses and sectors and the data just populating alongside and all of it coming together where it tells the, the full arc of the, the story you want to tell. And I would, I would just briefly add to that, that, you know, in email campaigns, I mean, we all get lots of email, obviously, um, but just always thinking about, I know, like, in one campaign that Andrew and I collaborated on for H, it's called Age Strong, it's in partnership with AARP Foundation, Capital Impact Partners, and, Cal and Calvert Foundation, you know, it's included in the, in the book as well, we just show the subject email lines that, like, toggle back and forth between this quantitative and qualitative um, content, so you're hitting 
the head, you know, these kind of rational questions that our heads have, and then this heart-based content, and you just have to go back and forth and repeat many times. Yeah. Any other questions? Looks like one back there. Thank you. Good evening. Excellent, excellent exchange. Um, my question is for Alpha about your decision originally to have such a strong communication team apparently early on in the life of your organization, which is a nonprofit. So how did you make that decision, justify it to yourself, to your board, to your donors, and how did it pay off in terms of increased resources for the organization? I think, uh, in part, maybe this is how I'm oriented, even though I never studied communications or marketing. I definitely, the rational side of my brain says it's absolutely central. Uh, so I don't even think I justified it. I was just, it's kind of like uh, the CFO, you know, you're like, um, yes, this, this has to happen. I was fortunate that I got somebody who built a team uh, because, you know, I thought I resourced it by just having this person. I was like, great, you know, you got comps taken care of. And before I know it, you know, they're like paid internships that became part-time positions, that became full-time positions. And it's, it is a hungry beast. Uh, I will definitely say um, there's like infinite needs for hyper-communication at every different level. And there are so many different um, skills needed. So, you know, you, you have like your strategic communications folk, which is really essential. And then you have, you know, your copywriters, your creatives, the people who get PR, etc. So having a core team enables you to learn uh, and to adjust with them without feeling the strain of uh, paying a lot of consultants to do different things, which would be hard to justify to my board. Uh, if I said I had a PR consultant, it would be harder to justify. But we've gotten a lot of visibility without actually having that kind of support uh, because we've just invested in having like every single entrepreneur we've worked with uh, over 1,900, soon to be over 2,000 entrepreneurs. We have a picture of every single one. Uh, that's part of the benefit that they get from us. It's a profile shot, but it also means we have a robust kind of uh, media assets to be able to talk about them and, and do the placements uh, as, as necessary. So it's interesting. So, um uh, a friend of mine, Ben Jealous, who used to be the president of the NAACP and was able to really add a lot of, um, reinvent the organization during his time there. He advised a friend of mine that typically social change organizations are really focused on their programmatic functions, then fundraising, then communication. And his point to me was, actually it's the reverse, right? If you, so the way that I think about it is None of us really thought we needed an iPhone until Apple told us that we needed an iPhone, right? <laughs> um, and the, the communication, the opportunity with communication is that we oftentimes think about, particularly in social change, is about fundraising and not market development, not actually creating the conditions in which we can expand uh, resources. And marketing and communication allows you the opportunity to do just that. When we focus explicitly on fundraising, we actually limit ourselves on our ability to bring in people to change minds, to create conditions in which we can expand uh, investment. And so that's sort of, you know, one of our challenges uh, as we're, as all of us who work in social impact and social change, is really we have to get outside of just the fundraising bucket. We have to think about how do we bring more attention and how do we create, increase awareness and market demand, right, for addressing these, these challenges and creating opportunities there. And so that's why, for me, communication is such an essential investment because it allows you to do the fundraising. It allows you to have the conversation about impact measuring it before people even understand that there needs to be impact need, right? Like there are a whole sort of issues that we're facing that people don't even aren't aware of. And, and so one of the challenges that I find that we put ourselves in, particularly from a fundraising perspective, is if we only focus on what people's interests are without creating uh, and expanding awareness and expanding interest so that people can understand that there's a connection. For example, if someone who's not interested in reentry and say Baltimore City, but the reality is Baltimore City is a place where without addressing criminal justice issues, you're not gonna be able to improve the city. So how do we expand awareness and market that is an opportunity for people to invest in? Yeah. 
one I, last. Oh. I, I would also add there is, I mean, a huge dimension here. If you look at the vast majority, like 99.9% .9 of nonprofit websites, you're going to see who the audience for those websites is, which is the donor community. So fundraising leads, which means then your core constituency is being talked about as opposed to talked to and engaged with. And that, I think, is one uh, piece of the communications challenge that we haven't figured out how to address and what are the strategies to be able to actually have that multi-threaded way to be able to talk to the various audiences because you know, when you pay for that consultant, your board is going to say, great, you know, hopefully they're going to deliver value. And they're saying, yeah, we're going to raise money. And so all of your messaging is to this audience. And I'm not even sure that actually works in getting you uh, donors. So, but it depends from mission to mission. Before you change your website, check with your communications consultant. <laughs> so we can take one last question and then release, release this for the evening if anyone has one. Uh, gentleman there. Oh, great. Yep. Thanks for the mic assist. Uh, thanks very much for the insights. Um, building on these last uh, answers that you provided, uh, how would you go about a campaign for the situation is this the organization is nonprofit, it provides, uh, in this case, symphonic music. 10% uh, 10, 10 of the resources, let's say, are used to provide uh, social services, in this case, a free school program for the kids in the entire uh, region. But we want to fundraise without necessarily causing all the money that comes attached just to fund that particular resource. But because we need a whole orchestra, right, let's say, to provide also well, the programs, right? Uh, so wh what do you think would be a way to approach the, the fundraising without constraining or restricting the, the funding? Um. I, I would be happy to answer that. Um, so in our case, we're a single mission-focused organization, so this makes it a little bit easier. Uh, and we also uh, started 14 years ago, right when this conversation around these kinds of line item restrictions were being really pushed uh, in the philanthropic community to really question like what what is this actually delivering um, or not delivering more importantly so what we've done and you know it works for a vast majority of our funding relationships uh, which means then more engagement and conversation and trust building is to get total budget support so it's you know this is what it's going to take to deliver on the impact we're promising you and here is total transparency you can tweak and measure all the things that you want to measure, but at the end of the day, you know, there is no way that I could deliver on this impact or let alone tell you about it if I don't have the, the resources in there. So total budget support, uh, and you could care about entrepreneurs who are, you know, formerly incarcerated or entrepreneurs who are uh, women. Uh, you, you can come from a variety of different interest areas, uh, but at the end of the day, it, it all has to be streamlined into one total budget that supports an actual impact agenda. All right. Well, thanks to the brilliance of all of you. Thanks to all Thank of you, you being here. Um, go enjoy evenings. <laughs>